final speaker is a fine example of Irish scholarship, but he's practicing it in a very unusual environment, the American University of Sharjah. Um, I don't know how many people in this room ha have been to Sharjah, but Sharjah, of course, is one of the lesser known um, uh, Arab Emirates and is disti distinguished by the fact that it is the most uh, fervent and the most dedicated uh, to Muslim and the preservation of Muslim culture in the most, I have to say, enlightened way. The quality of their uh, museums and their art galleries uh, is very high, all done with a certain kind of low-key um, Muslim reticence because they can't be seen to be kind of jumping around uh, celebrating things. But um, the education context there must be very interesting. Um, not that it's going to impinge too much on um, John Montague's presentation. Uh, John is the Associate, Associate Professor of Architecture there. Uh, he has taught in the Departments of Engineering and History of Art and Architecture at Trinity College and in the Departments of History of Art and the School of Architecture at University College Dublin. He has worked as a consultant historian on numerous conservation projects in Ireland, published a number of books and articles on, British architect on Irish and British architectural history and on 18th century map mapping. He is currently preparing a book on the history of the White Streets Commissioners, whom we all know, um, and he holds a PhD in Early Modern Architecture, Mapping and Art History from Trinity College Dublin, and an MA in Historic Architecture from Warwick University, United Kingdom. And I think that entitles him perfectly to be our last speaker today and to speak on a subject with which we have a little bit of, had a little bit of toing and froing, but it's parliaments, piazzas, and plinths. Thanks, Dennis, for your generous introduction and my colleagues today for the fabulous talks that have heard so much uh, interesting materials. Um, uh, and the Irish Architectural Archive, of course, always for their fantastic um, uh, staff and brilliant resources. All right. Um, uh, the question I'd like to address today is how parliamentary democracy expresses itself in its relations between enclosed interior chambers of assembly and the outdoor, outdoor realm of the public street and square. What's at play is the impact of space and its boundaries, interior and exterior on political discourse in parliamentary democracies. In this regard, the nature of the assembly chamber itself and its origins in the Greek building type of the theater will also be addressed. The Greek was not the only model, however, and I will briefly look at two others. We had some of this earlier um, today from Brian, the English and the Scandinavian. Uh, this is a kind of amateur anthropology uh, to architectural, applied to architectural and urban form. My, my thinking was greatly augmented by Nicholas Pevner's A History of Building Types, published in 1976, and Dayen Sujik and Helen Jones's Architecture and Democracy, published in 2001, to celebrate the opening of the new Scottish Parliament designed by EMBT architects. The question of how parliamentary buildings relate to public space is my own, and the sources for that come from a wider range of evidence I've assembled for today's talk. Democracy, which is the kratos, or rule of the demos, the people, is, essential, is essentially choral in nature, emerging from collective celebrations, uh, communal festivities, and the gradual working out at these events of collective power. We should expect that the latter, the latter, we should expect the latter to be some kind of oxymoron, collective power, as power emerges in societies and animal groups asymmetrically. The fact that people over the millennia found ways to share this out in any way equitably is remarkable in itself. Nevertheless, direct democracy, one in which everyone has an unmediated, unmediated input into how things are done, is a rare exception. The case of Athens, of course, with some um, provisos, is one such example, although, of course, collective decision-making there ruled out all non-citizens, therefore women, slaves, and resident aliens. I have little to say here about the architectural arrangement of monarchical or absolute rule. My subject is the architectural and urban nature of parliament and the square. Therefore, some kind of democracy is assumed. Full access direct assembly is sometimes referred to as ochlocracy. Aristotle argued that direct rule had descended in his day to merely mob rule. The alternative is when citizens elect from their number someone who will deputize their power, this being representative democracy. 
This condition is what provokes the question I am addressing here, the division in spatial and architectural provision for both the represented and the representative. The first remains outdoors, the second is inside the chamber. Somewhere in between the threshold or plinth, often merely the steps up to the grand building on its podium, becomes the moment of exchange between the two. The plinth in our world is place for political speech making, and in some ways is itself generally replaced by the media, originally Hansard's parliamentary reports, for example, or newspapers, and today TV and social media. That's all very well, but how does the mob, those who are represented, speak back to the deputy, <coughs> other than in elections, whose legitimacy and fairness will vary hugely? The frustration of generally inadequate processes of feedback manifests itself in protest and dissent, the question therefore becomes what provision, if any, is made for this side of the conversation. A representative democracy often manifests in the form of a Senate, which in classical Rome, yeah, that's the wrong slide. <laughs> that's the wrong slide. Uh, go back one, yeah, here. Um, Lucky I've got them numbered. All, everything, all is good. Um, a representative democracy often manifests in the form of a Senate, which in classical Rome was a mediation between the people and the monarchy, or the appointed consuls in the era of the Republic or the Emperor later on. The Roman Senate was a council of elders, generally elected from leading or ancient families. According to legend, Romulus appointed 100 of his best citizens as an advisory group, a kind of privy council, although members of this could be replaced at the whim of the king. The idea of an upper house remains the model for many bicameral parliaments, such as in France, Italy, the US, in Ireland, as well as in the House of Lords, where the elite hereditary elder model of king's advisors was the case until very recently, roughly speaking. The language of parliamentary architecture has therefore nearly always been classical, with the principal exception of the, of the British Parliament, whose origins were medieval. The parliamentary meeting can be an extreme sport, both inside and outside the chamber. Famous recent examples of dissent and faction fighting and even treasonous sedition on the inside are complemented by even greater forces at the exterior. This Francis Wheatley painting, referred to this morning, uh, but we didn't see, um, of 1780, recorded the gathering of the quasi-legal militia of the Irish volunteers around the equestrian statue of King William of Orange in College Green on the occasion of the Protestant King's birthday, 4th of November, 1779. The objective was to win free trade and the independence of the Irish Parliament from the British one, and its impact was immediate and successful. The Parliament House, seen at the edge of the painting, was exposed in this very accessible public space, vulnerable, vulnerable to the threatening entreaties of an armed and volatile pact. College Green is a gathering place, a, College Green, a gathering place since the Vikings is now dominated by traffic and is a major junction in the city centre. The parliament is now a bank. The form, former parliamentary piazza continues, although fairly rarely, to be used as a gathering space for great civic occasions. The role of the old parliament house as plinth is the only one now uh, so the, the Parliament House as a plinth is its only kind of function in these kinds of occasions. In her book, um, uh, The Human Condition, the great uh, mid-20th century uh, political theorist and philosopher Hannah Arendt explained how tyrants sought to do away with the political aspect of their great public spaces, or agora, and return it to its earlier, more exclusively commercial function only. We remember instead as Arendt and other theorists such as Henry Henri Lefebvre continued to emphasize the discursive nature of public space, the agora as a formative idea in the relations between architecture and politics, the polis, the civic state, being the generative matrix for political encounters. The Greek city-state, the polis, from which we get our words for politics, police, policy, politeness, etc., emerged around the 8th century BCE. I'm supposed to be somewhere else here, yeah. Um, participation was a responsibility for the Greek citizen, not just a right. 
In his treatise on politics, Aristotle defined the citizen as someone who gives judgment and holds office in public affairs and matters of justice. Isomania, the equality of each citizen before the law, took precedence and stood against opposing tyrannical models. From a spatial perspective, power is transferred from the closed world of the palace to the open spaces of the agora. Pericles, in his famous funeral oration recorded by Thucydides, stated that power was in the hands of the whole people, not a minority. Let us then uh, turn to Dublin. The Irish capital is unusual in having two cathedrals and arguably two parliaments. At least in the case of the parliaments, one is earlier and decommissioned. The second one is the building that this uh, conference, uh, for the most part, was celebrating. As we've already seen, the present parliament building at Leinster House was retrofitted into a former 18th into a former 18th century palace, albeit one that had already been converted by the RDS in the early 19th century. John Roke's mid-1750s view is among the earliest of that building in its residential splendor. The great rusticated gateway, uh, also talked about this morning, has not survived, and the original building was walled in twice. Uh, let me just pull out the, this here. Um, I mean, I, I haven't studied this in too much detail, even though Rogue is my subject, uh, but there's a wall here and then somehow it matches again on the other wall there. Um, uh, where it remains enclosed today by a wrought iron palisade, in contrast, visually, if not physically, penetrable by the public. Another much closer and slightly later view by uh, Malton, much closer to the building, shows a calmer, rustic scene. A couple of gentlemen and a horse speaking in the centre, not the horse, of course. Uh, some ladies and children, children and another horse at the doorway. But this building, as we know it today, was Ireland's second parliament house. I mean, this building was second, Ireland's parliament house. The first takes precedence in a much more substantial way, being not on, only Ireland's first parliament, but the first purpose built parliament building that I know of at least, built anywhere in the world in the modern era. It is to classical times that we must return for anything similar. And of course, Edward Lovett Pierce's superlative building was very much influenced by such models. The Dublin parliament's precedence is something some previous scholars found it difficult to bring themselves to admit. Uh, Pevsner, in his chapter on parliament buildings, in the book referred to uh, at the beginning, lists the Dublin building first but quite, can't quite bring himself to acknowledge its preeminence. Note, noting the importance of Burlington and Campbell's slightly earlier Palladian experiments, he admits only that Pierce's building is thus a building of importance in British architectural history. <laughs> An extraordinarily evasive comment, a kind of historical belittlement that is not uncommon in British architectural historiography in relation to the architecture of their subaltern neighbour. The Oxford Art Online, a preeminent resource of inestimable value, also struggles to accept the precedence of the Pierce Building, stating that the federal capital in Washington, D.C., begun in 1793, 60 years after the Pierce Building was completed, was the first true new parliament building. I can't understand it. I read it and I read it and I read it and I think. The next paragraph, he starts talking about the parliament building in Dublin, but they can't bring themselves to admit that it was the first one. Anyway, forget about it. So, um, however, Pierce's radical and unprecedented adoption of the theatrical form for the Commons Chamber in his bicameral Parliament House predates the theatre-shaped assembly chambers of French and American invention, which later buildings were which later buildings were derived from Gon Jacques Gondouin's anatomy theatre in the École de Chirurgie or the surgery school built in 1769 to 74, again, post-dating um, Pierce. Interestingly, uh, the Dublin Chamber was a theatre in the round uh, on an octagonal plan, a type rarely, if ever, used in any other parliamentary chamber. There was no doubt issues with such a space acoustically, uh, if nothing else, as Brian uh, has suggested. A circular or octagonal form suggests a deeply 
democratizing or non-hierarchical arrangement. It suggests as much. However, the entrance itself implies an axis and a hierarchy and or a division into sides uh, of the house. The same Francis Wheatley, who illustrated the protests outside the parliament, records its interior, or the interior of the Commons Chamber, on the victorious occasion in 1780 of Henry Grattan addressing the piled up ranks of fashionable onlookers in the upper galleries and his peers, not the peers from the upper house, but his peers on the chamber floor and benches below. The speech maker on such an occasion would find this a very particular form of scrutiny being watched from behind, sides, and front, one, ha would, one would have to circle the room in a dizzying fashion to en encompass all the audience in your sight lines. This was a veritable cockpit, not just in feeling, but also in its very design. The octagonal arena for cockfighting was not uncommon. Such an octagonal building created for Henry VIII at Whitehall in the 16th century was repurposed by Inigo Jones in the early 17th century as a theater, in fact. And this is a reconstruction drawing. There are original drawings, but this illustrates the building better for my purposes. And the octagonal shape was adopted again in Dublin at the end of the late 18th century, when Ireland came late to the fashion for cockfighting, as James Kelly, as the great historian James Kelly has shown, after its British neighbors who had been at it for centuries. A circular shaped cockpit close to the old medieval walls of Dublin, demolished when Parliament Street was opened across it, was reopened in an octagonal form nearby at Essex Street on a plot uh, that gave directly onto the river. And we can see that there, the Royal, or the Cockpit Royal. A great view of the 18th century Parliament House in its context can be had from a beautiful watercolour drawing of the building whose manuscript inscription attributes its authorship to the architect himself. Edward MacParlane strongly doubts this attribution as there are errors in the transcription of the building unlikely to be made by the designer. Uh, King William is ensconced directly in front of the centre of the, of the Parliament House in this drawing, which is another licence or mistake. Erected some decades earlier, its position had nothing to do with the later Parliament Street. Uh, sorry, with the later uh, Parliament. Um, we may note finally that the beautiful quadrant curving wings of the present building have not yet been built. The houses that crowd directly on top of the Parliament were not cleared until the 1780s and 90s. These curving walls will later act as a screen to a group of very varied buildings uh, behind them, uh, behind the screen. The central octagon of the commons, long since replaced by Francis Johnson's cash office. Yet even before the screens, in 1769, the anonymous author of Observations on Architecture had spoken of the disparate and disunified cluster of rooms behind the grand facade of the parliament, the muddled character of which has not much changed in this thrilling aerial view taken during recent conservation works uh, by Duggan Brothers Builders and Consar. The facade itself, the most arresting part of Pierce's monumental design, is composed of a giant order of ionic columns arranged around an E-shaped plan the source for which MacParland has suggested might have been the Augustan Forum in Rome. So I think it's reasonably self-evident, but this colonnade that comes down here and this break front, um, kind of temple front, or this image here, gives you kind of a hint of what maybe um, Paris was thinking about. First purpose-built parliament in Ireland or elsewhere it may be, the early 18th century building was not, of course, Ireland's first parliament. An Irish parliament was established from the beginning of English rule in Ireland, and it was peripatetic in its nature, sometimes in Kilkenny, sometimes in Drogheda, but mostly in Dublin. The lords sat in Dublin Castle, and the commons uh, in the choir or former cloister of Christchurch Cathedral. This careful late 17th century plan of the interior of the castle notes the location of the old parliament house and store burnt. 
This was the great hall of the castle ordered by Henry III in 1245, whose stone vaulted undercroft uh, was used as the gunpowder store, even as parliaments were held there from 1613 to 1671. The building was destroyed uh, uh, when the building was destroyed uh, by accidental fire. This gunpowder under the Parliament had ironic implications, and I quote from my own recently published section in the, in the New Dublin Castle book that has come out. At the first session of the new Parliament of 1613, the Catholics objected to its being held in the medieval hall because of the presence of the gunpowder, fearing that it and the great mass of troops. Uh, would be used against them. Referring ironically uh, to the recent gunpowder plot in England, the Lord Lieutenant Arthur Chichester stated that concerning powder being under the room, it is merely imagined for it was lately removed to places of more safety. Let it be remembered of what religion they were of that placed the powder in England and gave allowance to that damnable plot and thought the act meritorious if it had taken effect it would have canonized the actors. On that mildly ironic and incendiary note, I want to move now to the origins of the theater form for parliament buildings. The idea of the sub-circular or fan-shaped theater motive being used for democratic assembly originates, as does the theater itself with the Greeks. The central circular space of a theater is called the orchestra, coming from the Greek word orchestai, to dance. It derives its shape from the threshing floor where religious dances took place in the same place where grapes were laid out to dry. The dance was in honor of Dionysus, who else? The god of wine, and was performed as a group. There was no separation between actor and audience, all was chorus. This change as, changed as classical Greek theater evolved. Thespis introduced the first speaking actor independent of the chorus, and Aeschylus, a second speaker, therefore the idea of dialogue. The dish-shaped geometry evolved from regularizing the hillside declivities inside which, inside which, uh, inside which uh, later much larger, larger gatherings took place. The sloping terraces that would now surround the orchestra were for an audience who no longer took part in the performance per se. They sat in the theatron or auditorium, which emerged in the classical period. Note the fully circular orchestra and the symmetrical theatron of the great theater of Epidaurus, built around 350 BCE. The scene or scene, the groups of buildings raised upon a dais to the rear, emerged properly in the Hellenistic period. A good example is the theatre at Priene of around 300 BCE, whose Skene or architectural stage building has been partially restored in this photograph. The theatre is architecture as instrument. It's sloping Its sloping auditorium amplifies the speaker and is crucial in changing the choral unity of the gathering into a discursive process centered on the single voice, the isolated speaker. This is inherently hierarchical, the one versus the many, although the audience are far from silent bystanders and it is their response, whether vocalized or not, that gives energy to the performance. And indeed, the audience in the round, as opposed to, say, in an oblong hall like a cinema, has itself to look at as well. The political adoption of the theatre from form may well have been parallel to the evolution of the auditorium and or orchestra type theatre itself. The most important locus of this was at the Pnyx in Athens. Here, Athenians gathered in general assembly. All citizens, again, men, not slaves, uh, and only those of proven Athenian patrimony. So, you know, an olig olig oligarchy of sorts, but in principle, a beautiful idea. As noted already, uh, all citizens were required 
to tear it up. On days of assembly, which could be quite frequent, guards with red-stained ropes corralled the citizens from around the town towards the picnics. Stragglers uh, were therefore marked in red for their stubbornness for all to see. On a white costume, you know, that's going to be pretty clear, you know. A cubic rock at the radial center of the Pnyx, um, probably formerly the altar of Zeus, became the orator's bima or rostrum. This sovereign assembly at Athens was called the ecclesia, a word later adopted uh, by Christians for their own mass gathering or church. A smaller representative body of 500 men charged with managing day-to-day -day affairs and elected by lot for a single year only gathered at the Bouleterion, a rectangular building off the Agora, the main town centre of Athens, downhill from the Acropolis. No doubt it was for historical and symbolic reasons, as well as for the practical aspects of the amplified, amplified voice and the focus on the single speaker that this format was adopted when a new purpose-built parliamentary, when new purpose-built parliamentary assemblies were emerging at the beginning of the 18th century. But William Kent eschewed the motive in his unbuilt scheme for new houses of parliament at Westminster, a scheme based on the complex arrangements of interior space we associate with Roman baths. Um, we'll come on to why in a moment, but the two principal chambers very faded out here at the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So the traditional Westminster approach is followed, um, and I'll return to that point uh, in a moment. Despite Pierce's precedence in Dublin, the theatre type only really became widespread after Jacques Gondouin, Gondouin adopted the format at his anatomy theatre in his School of Surgery, which we've already seen, built in 1769-74. You'll note it's stepped to the Pantheon in Rome, too, with its semicircular oculus and coffered dome. The form was then adopted at Washington at the new Capitol building by the Scottish architect William Thornton. His design featured two rotundas, an elliptical one for the House of Representatives and a semicircular one for the smaller Senate. In the final plans and those that were built after the British Burnt Congress in 1814, and again when enlarged in the 1850s, both chamber, chambers uh, were semicircular. And that's the, a, a later version of pre um, the 1850s. So it's not the last version of Congress, but a kind of a middle stage. But you can see that both houses are now semicircular. Initially, after the French Revolution, the Salle des Machines, a great oblong building with a horseshoe shaped enclosure confined to one end, was used for the new French Assembly. But when a second chamber was needed, these were put into a Gondouin object in the Palais Bourbon in the 1790s. Its early 19th century manifestation, the Salle des Séances, being designed by Jules de Jolie in 1828 to 33. Attempts to adopt this format at Westminster by the reformist liberal politician Joseph Hume in the early 1830s came to nothing. Among the most interesting of the competition entries is the semicircular auditorium enclosed within a multi-story circular rotunda proposed by the architect James Savage. But in reality, an alternative, far more confrontational model already existed at Westminster, and it was retained, not in this painting, but in the later Charles Barry and AWN Pugin's New Houses of Parliament, built after the 1834 Westminster fire, as we've heard. This was a rectangular hall with both sides opposing. There's no middle ground except for the chairman or speaker. The source for this um, are the opposing stalls in a cathedral choir. The rectangular conclave of ministers in the English parliament was rectangular even when not gathered at Westminster. The model is the great hall, the type uh, we've already seen at Dublin Castle. In a sense, the English precedent makes Edward Lovett Pierce's choice of an almost fully in the round, albeit essentially Greek theatrical model, all the more striking. 
The chamber of the English House of Commons remained essentially confrontational. That great student of crowd behavior, Elias Canetti, stated that the two-party system of modern parliaments uses the psychological structure of opposing armies. And indeed, we might refine that to say that during leaders' question time, it is reduced to the single combat of opposing champions, but the armies looking on from the back benches. Hardly a system conducive to polite communal endeavor. Finally, um, there is a third model in the West, one which also had some impact in Ireland, and that is the Scandinavian or Viking one. This was an outdoor assembly, in a way resembling that of the Pnicks in Athens, but lacking the crafted application of geometry to evolve this into a permanent architectural form. An important example was the all thingy, thing being the word for a Scandinavian, a Scandinavian assembly, established in Iceland uh, in 930 CE. In this case, the speaker stood on a small hill or knoll, a miniature mott, and the tribal leaders, leaders gathered around him while dwelling in semi-permanent, yearly renewed turf booths with wool cloth roofs. A surviving example of the Norse model is the Tynewald, established in 1228 in the Isle of Man, with its low 12-foot hill at the centre. The Greek type, however, became the norm, and we see various iterations of it throughout most Western democracies. It is interesting that the Dáil chamber itself in Leinster House has managed, and it's not the only one, to somehow preserve the oppositional rectangular aspects of the London example within the Greek semicircular auditorium by elongating each end of the semicircle. When we Irish see pictures on the news of heated debates in the Dáil, the similarities to Westminster are more pronounced than to the more egalitarian shape of, for example, the French Assembly or the Assembly of the European Parliament. A similarly hybrid decision was made, for example, in the Australian Chamber of Representatives in which the kind of bitter, puerile, and at times misogynist instincts can be stirred up by the two Rottweilers held back by their owners, leads, type confrontation that results from the short space between opponents. The curvature in the almost wholly in the round assembly chamber in Louis Kahn's otherwise sublime Parliament House in Dhaka, Bangladesh, designed in 1962 to 83, is only slightly better. The ch chamber is only slightly better. The building is sublime. Um, you could see the urge to retain the oppositional and the essentially choral communal format of the circle or octagon. Without following through and establishing for myself a clear understanding of how the seats worked. In this example, the colorful chamber in Le Corbusier's spectacular and primitivist assembly building in Chandragar appears to be quite English in its setup. And that might not be surprising in that its principal, principal sponsor, Jawaharlal Nehru, is generally considered to have been a great fan of all things English, other than their direct rule of India, of course. Finally, the very beautiful assembly chamber built with locally sourced teak and sensitively composed by Geoffrey Bawa for Sri Lanka in 1979 to 82 is disappointingly binary in its composition and perhaps its politics. The tragic state of Sri Lanka today suggests that there is little by way of democracy at work there at the moment. The next question is, what is the relationship of the parliament to the city, and how does that play out in the public spaces that are adjacent to parliaments? Is a space to speak back ever intentionally yielded, and if so, how and when? We've already briefly acknowledged the role of the plinth at Leinster House as a theoretical locus of public engagement. However, this is not a speaking out to crowds across the realms of Molesworth Street, but to banks of newspaper photographers and television news crews. The gates are never breached in either direction, and contact in the sphere of the public gathering in Dublin's contemporary political scene tends to be, tends to be by way of protest. The placard holders at the most 
as their most humble walking backwards and forwards at the gate. And on bigger occasions, ranks of tractors or taxis gathered and grand speeches made from the tops of park lorries, which are directed from outside closed gates at the Dáil from Molesworth Street. The steps of the Capitol building in Washington, in a much more security conscious nation, one would imagine, are far more permeable to the crowd, sometimes with disastrous results, as we've, already, as we've recently seen. And the mall in Washington has always facilitated an orchestrated engagement between great masses of supporters, usually, and the individual political actor. In terms of this parliament to city square relationship, let's run through some examples. The Bulletarion, which is uh, figure 12 here, the Bulletarion at Athens gave directly onto the Agora. Its deliberations were easily overseen by the passing outsider and was therefore fully open to scrutiny, as were the members of this council at the full assembly held at the Pnyx. The Curia at the Forum Romanum, which is here, the Senate effectively, right? The Curia at the Forum Romanum was also an institution directly accessible to the street. This earliest of the Roman fora was far more irregular in shape than the later planned imperial forums we see higher up in the, photo, in the image, a reconstruction drawing. Um, and therefore, access to its denizens was less controlled, less monitored by sequence, issues of access and military control. Returning briefly to 18th century Dublin, and of course this is a 17th century map, and the first Parliament House, we are reminded that Pierce's Legislative Assembly House was built in a, at a historic, if not mythic, gathering space, the former Viking Common of Hoggan Green, <coughs> this space here, whose own thing mot assembly was nearby. It would be nice to think that Pierce's Parliament was located here because of its ancient heritage as a meeting place, but that is simply not the case. It's ancient heritage as a meeting place. It, Parliament's house was placed there for a series of coincidences, as we see. The Parliament was moved from the potentially incendiary Dublin Castle to the house of the Earl of Chichester, former Lord Lieutenant, in 1661, and the location of Chichester's old house on the site of the earlier Carey's Hospital was not inspired by civic, spatial, or democratic concerns. Indeed, we should note the general disaggregation of power in Dublin and similar unplanned cities where the several loci of power were staggered across the town in a relatively haphazard manner. Such buildings in Dublin, including the Tholso, the, Thal no, the, Thalso, the cathedral where we had the forecourts sometimes, the commons sometimes here, the old um, uh, Parliament was in the old uh, uh, hall, which was destroyed by fire in 1751, so not in this map. And then we've got to get down here to uh, the Parliament. And so this kind of series of different centres across the city. The splintered distribution of power also yielded great scope, scope for its processional display. The need for a ceremonial route of splendor that was equal to the participants riding from castle to parliament in the 18th century, of course this is not an 18th century drawing, but it's such a beautiful one I couldn't avoid it, was not supported by the accidental laneway of Dame Street which lay between them. So the procession from, da from the castle, which was the executive, to the parliament, which was the legislative, was down Dame Street, which was very narrow. Um, plans were therefore made by the White Street's commissioners from the 1770s to remedy that by way of two different avenues, one a widening of the already existing Dame Street, a second even more splendid between Castle and St. Andrew's round church to be marked by great crescent and circular shaped junctions. Uh, only Dame Street was widened in the end. Um, London was always also 
a disaggregated city with its separation of Westminster and the city of London from the very beginning. Indeed, it was only really in the 18th century that that gap was properly bridged. The governmental zone was itself in turn a binary one, uh, with Whitehall the seat of the executive a good deal north of the Palace of Westminster. So Whitehall up here and Westminster down here. These are joined by the long and now very wide avenue uh, of London's Parliament Street and Whitehall, off which we have the home and offices of the Prime Minister in the strangely sealed off Downing Street, a very early and exclusive gated community. Design cities have the opportunity to consciously orchestrate these relationships. Richmond in Virginia, one of the earliest state capitals and designed by Thomas Jefferson with the input of the French architect Charles Louis Clarisseau, is placed on a great hill and within a broad and welcoming space. Here. Its name, its placement on a promontory, the, the name being the capital, its placement on a promontory and its architecture based on the Maison Carré in Nîmes consciously evoke Roman associations of senatorial and august democracy. Stormont in Belfast, about which we learned so much in the earlier lecture, uh, or the last two lectures, was also placed on a hilltop site. This time, unlike the Richmond capital, which was planned contemporaneously with the emerging city, the Northern Ireland building is greatly removed from the center of the city and up a tremendously long avenue, dissipating any possibility one imagines of proximal protest. Whatever about jogging and cricket. Um, the compromise Potomac River site of Washington, D.C., chosen as a pacifying alternative between the great cities on the north and south of the east coast of the emerging United States, offered the opportunity to design a capital city from scratch. Its designer, Charles L'Enfant, superimposed upon a more regular orthogonal grid, a star-shaped grid of complex diagonals to limp, link up topographically advantageous sites across his imagined city, with the high spot of Jenkins Hill reserved for the capital itself. A triangular zone, and forgive the use of a Google map, a triangular zone was established with the long Pennsylvania hypotenuse linking the capital to the president's house and the mall running along the base to the Washington Memorial, which in turn leads us back northwards on the shortest side to the president's house. So, these edges are quite bleached, but there's the hypotenuse, there's the base, and there's the kind of other triangle. But of course, the Lincoln Memorial is also part of that uh, long uh, mall uh, and political theater, as it were. The latter, i.e. the president's house, was to be accessible by six great avenues, hardly the sealed off case of the executive in London's Downing Street, and makes for a kind of reverse panopticon, the most overlooked residence and seat of executive power one can imagine. There are other ways of arranging this. It is strange how the rationality of the gridded complex allowed itself in the hands of the great 20th century modernists to take on such symbolic overtones in its arrangement of the head, the capus of the capital after all, over the body in Le Corbusier's Chandigarh in the Punjab in India, and in Oscar Niemeyer and Lucio Costa's bird-shaped, also brand new capital city of Brazil at Brasilia. Zonal cities have a neatness in the mind of such megalomaniacal city planners but make for sanitized city cultures. And in the case of the city and the park dispersal of buildings, a very windswept and anti-urban approach to city life. Alternatives might be the much earlier arrangement found in Sweden, uh, where a main street runs right through the very heart of the governmental legislative and executive zones. Just uh, here. The government buildings on either side of that street. This symbolic, if not necessarily actual, access to the heart of power may have inspired the radical transformation 
of the Berlin Reichstag, the Berlin Reichstag, ironically perhaps designed by the English architect Norman Foster, in which a great transparent lantern is made of the dome above the chamber, which both focuses the light through a great glass cone directly into the space and acts as a transparent public gallery for those who would watch, or at least process around and above, the proceedings of the assembly below. This is my last section, and I'll be almost there. Uh, I wanted to end this paper by returning uh, to Athens and briefly in an idle fantasy to Dublin through the deep-rooted and speculative lens of the urbanist and sociologist Richard Sennett. In his lecture and later book titled The Spaces of Democracy, he focuses on the two central contexts for spatial discourse in Athens, the great open public square or agora at the heart of the city, which is downhill from the Acropolis, and the theatre of the Penix, where democratic decision-making took place. The agora is a place where we encounter the stranger, he argues. The theatre as political forum is a place of more focused attention and concentrated decision-making. Senate records how at the Pnyx the rostrum or bima was on the west and the sun was on the speaker's face from morning to the early afternoon. Long daylight led to duration, a sustained focus, not a place for surface or momentary impressions or quick decisions. Senate referred to it as a disciplinary space of the eye, voice and body, where its political actors were held accountable. The large open civic and commercial space of the Agora was originally arranged with some rock-cut steps around the edges of the roughly trapezoidal centre. The route of the pan athenaic festivities was traced diagonally across the square. Later, a series of long halls with screens of columns facing onto the Agora, the stoas, were built. These were areas of retreat from the intensity of the centre and the sun and the rain and the north wind and allowed for a different, more relaxed interaction from the busy intensity of the Agora. Aristotle, again in the politics, referred to the awareness and active tolerance of difference that takes place in the city as synergismos. The city is, essentially, is an essentially pluralist place where, Aristotle argues, we become used to diversity, complex actions and identities, where we don't make strange at strangeness. Finally, Senate argues that in order for a true democracy to work, a city needs both of these things, a true open space of interaction, an encounter with the diversity of the other, and another more focused space where sustained and concentrated encounters lead to attentive and more complex discursive decision making. The Athenian model was unique and, and flawed, particularly in that these city states usually worked best with populations of 5,000 to 10,000 10, citizens. Not viable at all, unless for devolved or decentralized uh, government. Of course, they were sexist and racist, but they present a tantalizing and probably impossible model of social encounter founded on spatial intelligence, an open street or square for encountering the other in all of her diversity, and an enclosed theatrical arena for sustained mature political deliberation. The great open squares of the Italian piazzas with their stoa-like arcaded loggia to the sides and all their palazzo publicos on the edge hint at the same kind of condition. In Dublin, we had a great gathering space, accidentally or not, at our former parliament building on College Green. This space is up for grabs in current ambitions for a more human-scaled city and a more sustainable one, and so College Green might be pedestrianised, or at least partially so. And there was that elusive moment after the banks were refinanced by the state following the crash of 2008, when we could fantasise about the recovery of the parliament house to the state. Of course, Pierce's octagonal space of assembly was demolished and converted by Francis Johnson to a cash office. It was a condition of the sale to them by the government at the beginning of the 19th century, lest, as the eminent historian of the bank and parliament house, Tom Curran, recounted, lest disquieting ghosts might still haunt the scenes that were consecrated by so many memories. Imagine a citizens' forum here in an octagonal chamber in a building recovered to the Irish people. We can't, of course. The bank has it. And none of us would demolish Johnson's sumptuous work of conversion. Nor can the condition of the stoa, uh, the arcaded halls at the edge of the space for um, 
for retreat, be recovered from the commercial interests on the south side of the street, once lined with other banks and insurance companies. Still, one can always dream. Thank you.